Hi, I'm Amy Smart. What's up? I'm Carter Osterhaus. And we are ha here on behalf of Harvard Chan Sea Change and the Environmental Media Association, where we both sit on the board of directors. Um, we serve on the board of directors. And this is called Emma Talks Real Science, where we talk to a scientist about important climate, equity, environmental, and public health issues. And today we are fortunate enough to talk to Dr. Elsie Sunderland, and she is the Gordon McKay Professor of Environmental Chemistry at Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and Department of Environmental Health at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot. Uh, Dr. Sunderland's research studies the biogeochemistry of global contaminants. She conducts both field studies and modeling to better characterize the cycling and fate of heavy metals and organic contaminants and associated health exposures and risks. Whoa, Dr. Elsie. <laughs> <laughs> so how many of those words meant anything to you? I mean, <laughs> your credentials are so impressive. I can barely get them out of my mouth. But um, I can't wait. I, let's dive into this conversation. Can you just tell us a bit about what exactly you do? <laughs> sure. So as my title said, I'm an environmental chemist. And so we do, in my research group, we do a bunch of different things. So like a chemist, we... Well, we don't work because I'm an environmental chemist. We don't keep ourselves in the lab. We go out to different uh, field locations. So we go to lakes and rivers and estuaries and on cruises in the ocean. Um, and we take in samples um, from the environment and we measure the different levels of toxicants or chemicals um, in, in the environment in different compartments. And we also, you know, the goal of our research is to um, understand how much pollution is being released. So both at a local scale, but also at a global scale. Um, so how it gets into the air, how it gets into water. So either our drinking water, our rivers, or our lakes, or our estuaries. Um, and then ultimately to think about how those chemicals make their way into living organisms. So how do they get into food webs? How do those food webs accumulate those chemicals? And then what does that mean for us um, interacting with those environments or eating different types of, of foods? And so, so that's what we do as researchers. So we, we, we take measurements um, of these chemicals or we build models to describe how they're moving through the environment and how long they stay there. Um, but I would really say our, our ultimate goal, I, I was having this discussion with a few of my students, our ultimate goal is really to prevent uh, communities and individuals from being exposed to toxic stuff that they don't know about. Um, which, it, you know, and this is I think a big issue because many of the things that, that we um, look for. People don't know um, that these chemicals are, are in their water, or in their food until we do these studies. So that's, that's really our goal. Um, right. And then and probably there's that. so much, so many different levels of exposure as well. Exactly. Right? I yeah. mean, the, the people, not just consuming fish. Correct. Absolutely, absolutely. So a lot of our work is thinking about those different ways people are exposed. So you can be exposed to something by breathing it into your lungs or different types of food that you eat. A lot of the things, you know, we have a lot of great chemists in society. So we, we build all these smart materials and smart packaging. Um, and those, those products themselves often uh, expose us to different types of chemicals. Um, so there, there are many different ways that, uh, that we can be exposed to these toxicants. And I love to talk about this. Um, it generally gets me disinvited from a lot of dinner parties. <laughs> um, not everyone wants to know all the different ways you can be exposed to horrible chemicals. But, uh, but I think, you know, I think, I think this, this is important because we want to have um, the right to choose um, what we're exposed to, as uh, Gina McCarthy says, you know, we, we should have the right to a healthy life if we make, you know, if we eat good food and exercise and take care of ourselves. And so it's really the things where 
um, we as individuals are not able to control these chemical exposures that I'm, I'm most interested in um, because that, that becomes a, a regulatory and a policy issue. Mm -hmm. So if we just right now focus on like the ocean and sea mm -hmm. and climate change, mm -hmm. um, can you just kind of talk about the link between that? Sure, sure. So um, I think, uh, so the ocean is of course 70% of the earth's surface. So when we have different types of, of chemicals that we release to the environment, many of them go to the atmosphere and then they're washed out or deposited um, into the ocean and the surface of the ocean. And then the ocean is sort of this vast reservoir that can accumulate these contaminants over long periods of time. Um, the, the sort of vegetation of the sea, so the base of the food web is the phytoplankton in the ocean. Um, and so those can take up those contaminants when they're deposited uh, from the atmosphere. And then there's a bunch of interactions that happen in marine food webs, um, which are dictated by the, the type of ecosystem that's present. And so when we have climate change, there's a whole bunch of different things that can happen. So the, the most obvious one, I think, is just the temperature element. So the ocean is actually absorbing a huge amount of the excess uh, radiative forcing. So the heat that's being reintroduced to the surface of the Earth um, by the increased um, abundance of different greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So there's a lot of heat coming to the surface of the earth and the ocean is providing a buffer for that right now. So what we're starting to see, and it, it's, it's very variable across different regions of the ocean, but we're starting to see uh, seawater warming in different areas. And in some you know, localized ecosystems, you can already see quite pronounced seawater warming. And then, so, so what does that do to the things that are living? Um, so the thing, and our connection to this is of course through the seafood um, and through fish. Most people eat fish from commercial um, sources. So you eat it from the grocery store, you get it at restaurants, and that's all part of the commercial seafood market. Um, so the, the temperature warming is actually, um, in simple terms, um, making those fish more hungry. So their, their bioenergetics or their energy requirements, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, so that, so their, their metabolism is really dependent on the temperature of the seawater. And when the water warms, those fish, their metabolism speeds up. And um, when you're talking about a chemical, so the main, the main pathway of, of different chemicals, so one that most people have heard of is mercury or methylmercury, which, um, so the, the main source of methylmercury uh, for a big fish is eating smaller fish. And if the, the seawater temperature warms up, then those fish are gonna eat more. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And, and so you, you guys will like this. So then if, if, if the fish eats more and, the, you know, and it, it hasn't been this perturbation to its metabolism, um, often you know, fish will eat a lot and then grow. And so a good dilution mechanism for ingestion of chemicals is simply to have more mass. So you can dilute it by those fish growing bigger. But under those warming conditions, the fish eat more, but they're burning off all that energy. Um, so they're um, basically ingesting so that fish. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, like you want a fat fish. fish. <laughs> yeah. This was actually this, this perplexing problem I had in graduate school, which my professor gave me, fat fish, skinny fish. And so we talked about it for years. So which one would have more chemical in it? Um, but, this, but, but you see, so there's a number of different areas of science intersecting to lead to this, this issue. Yeah. And, and for a fish, I should say, so the fish that are most affected by just that direct seawater warming, are some of the big, we call them pelagic predators. So the big fish that are most valuable in the industry. So things like tuna or swordfish or shark. Um, and those also tend to be the ones that are right at the top of the trophic pyramid. So they have the highest levels of some of these contaminants. And so, so that's, that's one way that climate change can, uh, 
can impact contaminants and, and fish. And then there's this connection, of course, to the ocean. Um, and the other way is, uh, is I, I actually, you know, it's, it's also, to me, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so the, just as the temperature warms, so these fish are very sensitive to the temperature of their ecosystem. So they'll eat more and they'll try to compensate for about, I'd say one to two degrees is the maximum degree centigrade. Um, and, uh, and after that, they move. So there's a phenomena going on in the world right now of what we call local extinction. I don't know if you guys have, have heard of this or read about this. So where the fish are basically moving north. But not extinction. You've read about? Like I hear more about o ocean acidification and like uh -huh. the reefs and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this, this, is not, this is not like those fish are disappearing from the face of the earth. This is, but in, in a local ecosystem where you've had a fishery, you've had fish present for many years, a local extinction is when those fish move out. They basically say it's not suitable anymore. And so as we see water warming more and more, so there are all these climate models projecting for say 2050, you'll see um, like very large rates of local extinction, particularly around the equator, where the water is, is warming the most. And those fish are basically moving north. The people may be moving north as well. Um, it, it, it's, it's pretty cool because um, if you look at the commercial market data in the US, I'm sure you guys have spent lots of time doing this, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can, you can already see this in the fish that people eat in the United States. So people are, are able to get those fish still, but the, the source of those fish is moving north for many, many of the common commercial species. So things like pollock, which are uh, fake crab, in many like large mass produced uh that's like the crab stick yeah the crab stick uh, we're like if you ask anyone if they eat pollock they'll say no wait so what sorry i said if you ask anyone if they eat pollock they'll absolutely say no <laughs> right. okay but pollock is one of the most commonly consumed fish so that's an example of where oh. yeah so they're all they're moving north so so when you have a local extinction, I mean, you can, again, you think about that trophic pyramid. So you think about if you're eating a tuna, that tuna is eating a lot of other things below it, which is eating things below it. And as you move up a trophic level, then you tend to get more contaminants. So whether it's mercury or something, an organic contaminant, it's a process we call biomagnification. And then this is a quiz, what's right at the top of the food web? Whales. <laughs> Whales are. What else? Where are we? Uh, what, humans? Okay. Humans Depends right. on if you're vegan or not. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're actually quite, I, I, always, I always ask this question. I'm like, what's at the top of the food web? And everybody's like, humans are. And I'm like, no, polar bears. Oh. Because <laughs> the polar bears eat the humans, right? <laughs> right. Totally. Um, so, but so the the when when fish move around and different fish are and different organisms that have um, different sensitivities to seawater temperature when they move around you basically change the pattern by which organisms accumulate and that can also have a big impact on their. Wow. Like, it sounds like migration and just like when the climate goes so off the migration of the butterflies and all the different. You know. Exactly. So all of all of the species in the ocean. And so one of the interesting things to think about is not just the contaminants, but what this does to communities where people are really dependent on those fish for protein and nutrition. Um, because a lot of local fisheries will be impacted, um, how those fish are managed. So to maintain the health of those fishery is based on historic data about their abundance. So there's a lot of implications of the movement of those fish. One of them is for contaminants, but not, you know, it's certainly not the only impact that we can think about. Um, so we think about climate change and it's really changing everything that we know about the natural environment, right? And so we have to understand, well, what drives how these ecosystems interact? and right. then try to predict what this will mean for the different things that we're worried about.
Yeah, I feel like when you talk about like how these ecosystems are affected, though that's an area where we don't, well, you probably talk about it a lot and, and we do too, but I feel like a lot of people just don't do that deeper dive into how the ecosystems are truly affected <clears throat> and what that means mm -hmm. to that life and what that, how that life lived. So for instance, and I feel like Amy and I are, we're so passionate about the, the Amy grew up in, we both grew up near bodies of water where mine was Lake Michigan, hers was the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. And so we're, you know, still very much connected with that. But even like in Lake Michigan, you know, you've seen the migration happen of the ecosystem with just the introduction of like the Edelweiss and then the King Salmon and, mm -hmm. and that changed a lot. And yeah. people are trying to figure out, okay, how do we switch? Uh, but now when you start talking about, you know, stuff like mercury and, and heavy chemicals, I mean, that's like, it's like doubling down and it, it makes it tremendously more um, mm -hmm. invasive, not just to the fish, but obviously to us. I guess, you know, my question I wanted to ask you is, is that with, you talked about the, the rising sea levels, uh, the, the temperatures, and then, um, but also overfishing, like how is that? Um, and then overfishing, is that? increasing the levels of mercury and then also are there other chemicals that we're not talking about because i feel like amy and i we've been sort of cognizant of like okay how many times have we had fish this week you know because of mercury but that's all we say we don't talk about any other chemicals mm -hmm. and which fish do you guys like to eat you know we stick to like shrimp and salmon <laughs> right i do like tuna but i'm just i know i always think that's probably so full of mercury that I just every once in a while have that. Right. Or white fish, you know, right. um, a little yeah. perch. Yeah. So, I mean, fish are an incredibly healthy food. So you can actually eat a fair bit of fish without having, you know, unless you're um, expanding your family. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. and then I would say be really, really careful. But uh, mercury, for example, is a neurotoxicant. Um, so it's, it's most important um, during the third trimester of pregnancy, those exposures, and uh, during early life for children. So those fish that you're eating, you know, there's no real necessary cap on them. Um, but going back to this question of overfishing, um, I think you were already on to it when you were thinking about the Great Lakes and the introduction of those invasive species. So it's, it, it's, it's a, a sort of flipped version of that where basically if you take out a, a fish or you change the interaction of different species, and it's a, it's a lot like that, that local extinction idea that we were talking about a minute ago, where you, 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 you sub out some part of the ecosystem, then everything compensates. So those fish that humans are consuming will eat something different if, if say, a prey fish has been overfished. Um, and that, that can actually go in both directions. Um, so we did some work on this in the Gulf of Maine, which is right next, so it's, it's part of the attached to the Western Atlantic Ocean. It's, I'm in Massachusetts, of course, and uh, so it's wait, right next to us. And these are our very historic fishing areas. Um, but we looked at, uh, at cod fish, fisheries, for example, and you can see uh, shifts in uh, prey abundance over time fluctuating. So what they eat fluctuating in actual records. So what the fishery scientists did, this is pretty cool, I think you guys uh, looking for alternate employment. So there are people who actually take fish, dissect them, and uh, keep records of what's in their stomachs for thousands and thousands of fish. So you can see their diet changing over time. Um, and so that, that can lead to either um, more contaminant in some cases or less, depending on whether what they were eating had a higher or lower level of that contaminant. So it's, it's, I would say it's not a overfishing always leads to more contaminants in fish. It's that, and it's the same thing with invasive species. You don't, you don't really know what's going to happen when you perturb that, that natural system and change it to something else. And it could go higher, it could go lower, and you'd have to go look at it to understand. Um, if it's a fish, like we're talking about, that you want to eat three or four times a week, then you really want to understand, you know, how much was that, that increase and is it something that, that we should be concerned about or is it something that we really think 
the benefits of that fish or that food really outweigh any any risks of of those contaminants accumulating should we be concerned about other toxins besides mercury yeah so <laughs> um it, so so the general uh i mean i i think mercury is is a a sort of archetype of many different types of contaminants in that 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 same process where the um, chemicals that sort of magnify when one thing eats another thing. So we call that trophic magnification. So that happens for methyl mercury, um, but it also happens. Can you explain what that means exactly ma when magnify like. So it becomes much higher. So basically, um, you would you could drink. Uh, you'd have to drink um, 10,000 uh, liters of water to get the same amount of mercury as one 100 gram tuna fish meal. And, and the reason, and, and so the, the trophic magnification, so, so taking the concentration of mercury in say a given water body versus the concentration of mercury in that predatory fish it means it's magnified by that much. And, and the reason it's magnified is because it's, um, you know, it, it basically wants to get into that base of the food web and it distributes in the, the tissues of, of the, the marine organisms. And then it, each time it's eaten by, you know, each time one fit, a small fish eats it and then a medium fish eats it and then a larger fish eats it. Um, it gets much, much higher in concentration. So for something like mercury, you can actually guess pretty accurately at what the concentration will be in a fish just by knowing what level of what we call the food chain um, that fish is located on. So that's, does that make sense? It, yeah, it definitely makes sense. And, you know, I feel like when I go to the market, you know, there's, there's the option of buying something that's wild caught. There's responsibly sustainably farmed or just farmed and then from different parts all around the world that they are selling they're like well this is from thailand and this is from the atlantic and this is you know and it's kind of like you're trying to make some educated deci decisions but i don't really know where it would be the best place to get them from or you know what method of you know growing them are I would always think not farmed, but then I don't know, maybe farmed is okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and that, that takes us back to Carter's question, which is what are the other contaminants in fish? So it turns out for mercury, farmed fish have a lot lower mercury because they're fed a very different diet. So they don't have that same degree of, of what I was calling trophic magnification. Um, but, uh, but, but, there's a lot of different other contaminants. So mercury in a fish um, binds to protein tissue where a lot of um, contaminants accumulate in, in the fat of those organisms. And so because they have these different ways of accumulating, then different contaminants will be present in different fish. So salmon are very low in mercury, but they can have very high levels of, of different, what we call persistent organic pollutants. So these are things like uh, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, or um, brominated flame retardants, and, and things like this. And it, and it depends on the system where it's caught, as you say. Um, but I think I, I want to take a, a step back from all of this, because I'm freaking you out about fish, <laughs> which I often do. And I don't <laughs> think it's the right thing to do, because fish are actually a really great, you know, like when you, when you do, um, you know, a comparative risk analysis and you say, okay, if somebody is concerned about contaminants in fish and they go eat a hamburger, what's the net impact on their health? Right. Well, they were better off eating that fish, right? Mm -hmm. And it goes back and actually fish are quite sustainable. And even, you know, there are some aquaculture practices that aren't great and can have a negative impact on the environment. But frankly, like we need sustainable aquaculture. So by all means, eat eat farmed fish, but push for, you know, sound environmental practices when those fish are farmed. Don't say like something is bad or something is good. 
And the thing I think we really need to do that we can all agree on. So every time I write a paper and I say mercury are accumulating in these fish, you know, and climate change is making it worse, then the next day there's a website dedicated to rebutting all our findings saying fish are a healthy food, which is true. And right. that's not what our paper was, you know, or our work was about. Yeah. What we're really interested in saying, and I think everybody would agree with, is wouldn't it be great to not have more mercury in your fish? And wouldn't it be great to not have persistent organic pollutants in your fish? Isn't that kind of a no-brainer? Right. So, so how do we do that? Well, we go back to the source mm -hmm. and we say, hey, maybe we don't want to release these globally persistent burdens of different environmental contaminants and maybe we should enact policies to curb their releases or when they're released we clean them up and and that i think to most people makes perfect sense um, unfortunately there's a disconnect between people's awareness of these contaminants and then the regulators who are actually responsible for trying to reduce levels in the environment. Um, yeah, it's such a healthy, that, or not a healthy, but it, it, you have to have that balance of trying to, because, you know, omega-3 fatty acids is what, you know, we all need that in our diet. And you have to sort of toe that line of not scaring people about mercury, but letting them, you know, be aware of it. And, but at the same time, because fish are still healthy for you, you want to eat fish, but you don't right. want to so, so you want to eat fish, but we want less mercury in our fish. So how do we get less mercury in our fish? Well, we do things like regulate our coal-fired utilities and put pollution controls on them. Well, it's, that, it's, is, that is a great segue. <laughs> my next question, which I'm, this is why I'm actually really yeah. excited that you're on with us because yeah. I, not switching too much, but regulating. You know, yeah. I was looking at some of your stuff uh, earlier and, and I noticed like in 2014, you were... I think more maybe more heavily working with the EPA. We all know under this administration that's changed quite a bit. The EPA has. Mm -hmm. the EPA was always like our level of for me of what I thought it was. It was Protection. taking care of yeah, it was protecting us. And mm -hmm. it didn't matter like, you know, who was there, what policies, you know, there's a little shift here and there, but not much. Now I feel like that has totally changed. And I'm super curious because you've worked so close with the EPA. Are you still working with them? And um, are you scared? <laughs> because they're, they're not there anymore. Because I, 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 you don't, don't want to get scared. You want to get angry. Yeah, yeah. Demand change, right? right? So one thing I learned. So actually, before I, so between my PhD and uh, and joining the faculty at Harvard, I did work in uh, Washington D.C. at EPA headquarters for five years. Um, and one of the things that you learn working there is how much when communities and people and individuals complain about something that pushes regulations forward right. so and that that goes back to what i was saying a minute ago which is you know we don't want to scare people away from eating a food that's healthy for them but if you're aware of an issue and you can talk about it and demand something then that's how change starts to happen um, and then, of course, EPA has been, I mean, it's the environmental track record of this administration has been abysmal. Like, it's, it's, it's horribly depressing, and we've rolled back. I don't remember, I can't remember the count anymore, how many different environmental regulations, and it's embarrassing. And I'm on all sorts of listservs, and I get notifications on uh, how they're very proud of their new regulatory effectiveness and saving taxpayers. Uh, money by re reducing the burdens associated with these unnecessary costly regulations. And so um, it's upsetting, but I don't think, you know, I think it just means we have work to do. There are a lot of great, so there's a, a lot of people actually also when I worked at EPA didn't realize the EPA is a, is a, it's a regulatory agency and it's tied to the current administration. So a lot of people, I think Carter felt as you did, which is, this is a government body that protects me and will do so regardless of the political climate, where in fact it does fluctuate a lot depending on the political climate, never to the degree that we've seen recently. 
Um, but what it what what you have at the agency is is many layers of very dedicated staff people who are committed to their science and and to their work. Um, and I would say that almost that adds inertia in times when perhaps we go in a direction that's that's deconstructing some of the progress we've made environmentally. Um, and so that's that's I, I'm trying to think of the the positives here. And I don't want to just say, oh, EPA is, is so bad, because I think EPA is a great agency and they've had some really hard times in recent years and they've made some political decisions, which I think are not protective of the communities um, in the United States and are clearly not focused on protecting the health of people. Yeah, I know um, it's crazy. It's like sometimes politicians still even use that rolling back regulations and save the taxpayer money because they're doing that's like even a talking point which to me just seems like wow you know how are people not recognizing that that is it's not by far <laughs> they, well, <laughs> it's, it's just not that, that's not a great thing mm -hmm. i guess are you still do you still work with the epa at all yeah in fact i do so i work uh with the agency right now i'm working with a group of scientists at the agency and across the different federal agencies on the the minamata convention which is the global uh, treaty on mercury releases which the agency is still supporting um hopefully no, no one from the agency will watch this and then be flagged to the fact that they're still doing this yeah that's yeah. so great but, but, but they're you know this this is a global agreement um with um more than 100 nations aimed at reducing uh anthropogenics of human sources of mercury to the environment and that's exactly what we need to protect our tuna as we were talking a minute ago and so you know the agency is still moving forward with that um, other things, so some of my work recently has been focused on the things that EPA is not doing. So for example, with uh, there's a, a law, uh, an environmental law clinic at Harvard um, that I work with quite closely. And we've been writing briefs and uh, various court and doing various court filings to basically say, you know, all the problems we have with different regulatory actions EPA has been taking, specifically around these coal-fired power plants. Um, and so we're not working with the agency, we're filing court briefs, um, but those comments are actually then taken by scientists in the agency and they try to incorporate that in, in this sort of series of, of legal actions. Now, whether it's enough or actually makes a difference, we don't know, but these are things that that you can do, um, you know, any any of those decisions that the Environmental Protection Agency makes, they're published as public documents, and any individual in this country can comment on them. If it's a unique comment, they're legally obligated to respond to your comment. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're like, this is, and I try to say this to my students as well, like we are empowered here we, we have huge you know a huge amount of leverage over what these government agencies can do and we just have to remember that and not not get you know horribly depressed when things take a, the, a direction that maybe isn't great with the mercury going into the environment into the ocean is it predominantly from coal-fired plants or yeah so um in the in the united states the largest remaining source is coal-fired power plants mercury is actually i mean i know we haven't talked about it this way but in terms of regulation prior to this administration i would have really said mercury was an environmental success story okay. um, so there were there are a whole bunch of industries that used huge amounts of mercury in the 1970s um, it, and it used to be used in a ton of products. So there were the mercury batteries, mercury fillings and teeth. Um, it was used in paints and uh, as a pesticide and, and sort of mercury was everywhere. Um, we used to add it to crops as a fungicide. Think about that. Um, and all of this was phased out because people looked at it and said, oh, maybe this isn't great for us. You know, we have these acute poisoning incidents and you know, there are these health impacts that we're concerned about. And so this regulatory action took place. Um, you could actually see between 
the 1990s and the mid 2000s, about a 30% drop in the concentration of mercury in the atmosphere um, wow. throughout the Northern Hemisphere. So this was really good. Um, and part of that was in fact, so the thing about this coal-fired utility regulation is it's already in place. So that the industry has already invested technology to control mercury emissions um, and reduce mercury emissions from their peak from coal-fired utilities by about 90%. So it's a huge reduction. It's already in place. The technology has already been acquired by all those coal-fired utilities and yet still they rolled it back. Ah. It doesn't make any sense. Even the industry doesn't want them to do it. Ah. Why? I mean, because they've already made that investment. So it makes, it makes zero sense. And it does cost a little bit to keep that technology running. So if, if there is no rule, it seems unlikely that we'll continue to see those stringent reductions in emissions and we'll likely have more from coal. Um, but in terms of, I, I don't know if, <laughs> if that was, That's but, all, but know, I, didn't, I didn't entirely answer your question. Sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> no. No. Okay, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I think, well, yeah. well, I mean, that, I think there's, you know, um, I, I, I feel like, I don't even know where to go on this, but there, there's, I, first of all, I just want to say I love the fact that you're still with the EPA and you're working with them. That yeah. makes me feel really good. I don't work for them. Previously, I work for them. Now right. I work at arm's length from them. Yeah. <laughs> but we want to view them as a team member, right? Right. Um, but, okay, so we talked about fish. Uh, can we talk about drinking water a little bit? Um, where, where is that now? Where does that sit now? How does it change? I know it obviously changes from location to location. Um, but should people, I don't want to say, you know, be concerned, but I just, again, be aware of drinking water and the mercury levels and everything. Drinking water? Yeah. So drinking water is almost like a, its own universe. So fish and these bioaccumulative contaminants are sort of one, one area that we can be concerned about. Um, I think a lot of people um, much as you said a moment ago, Carter, they, they feel like their drinking water is safe. Um, and so drinking water is something that we started looking at recently because we realized, you know, there are certain chemicals in drinking water that just aren't getting the attention that they deserve. And um, historically, we've been, you know, if we look at, at different regulations that protect public health in this country, um, the regulations for air quality have been very, very effective, and we've done a really bad job at protecting drinking water. Um, there were a few surveys in the 1970s and the 1980s where, where the government agencies went out and looked at all the different chemicals in people's tap water, and they said, oh my gosh, there's a lot of stuff here. So like heavy metals and different organic pollutants that really we don't want there. Yeah. And that, that was the origin of what we have that protects or is, is meant to protect our drinking water, which is called the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and so this is a very ambitious regulation and it basically says, so we, we, we have regulations for about 80 different contaminants in drinking water um, and, and the idea was, so this was formed in the early 80s, the idea was that you, you start with an initial list of contaminants that might be of concern, and then you add a bunch more as we learn more about them and figure out which ones are, are you know, of, of the most concern. So that sounds great, right? We sound like we're on the right track. Right. So, so what do you think happened? Did we do that? Take a guess. Oh, no. no. <laughs> Yeah, so, so there's, a, there's something called a, a, a CCL, so a contaminant of concern list. And we've never effectively, since the enactment of the Safe Drinking Water Act, added another chemical to that list. So essentially, we're, wow. it's just an archaic regulation. And then you see, when you think about drinking water, um, you know, again, most people are, are feeling like it's safe and you, th you see things pop up like what happened in Flint, Michigan a few years ago and that related to lead. Um, 
And, and so these old, old issues, you know, this isn't climate change. Climate change is our, our mission for the future. This is, this is, these are things that we know how to fix and we just haven't done it, right? So there's technology to take these pollutants out of drinking water and it's a matter of cost and it's a matter of political will. And it's a matter of communities knowing that these things are in their water. Um, so that's, that's really where I think we are with drinking water. I think there's a lot of new um, tools now that we can use because there are uh, different data sets. So there are different environmental groups like the Environmental Working Group that have put together millions and millions of measurements of people's drinking water across the country and we can mine those data to say where are their communities that we're worried about. Really? On um, the EWG yeah. website you can kind of find out where? Yeah, if you go to the EWG website, they've got all sorts of nice visualization tools for what's in your water, and they're actually doing a ton on this. Um, and so the, I would say almost the NGOs are stepping up now in this space um, and doing some of the things that, that we would think historically a regulatory agency like the EPA would do. Right. Um, and I, I guess, I, you know, so, so this is one issue and that's sort of the old issue, which goes back to the, the thing I was saying a moment ago, which is, you know, we just, we need to take action. We need to look at those data and say, no, this is not acceptable um, and dedicate public resources to addressing this. Mm -hmm. And then there are new things. And for the new things, the thing I'm most concerned about um, is a new class of chemicals that are called PFAS. Did you guys see the movie Dark Waters no. with Mark Ruffalo? So go watch it. We should watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go watch it. And this is a true story. And these chemicals are just everywhere in people's drinking water right now. And I'm really concerned about them because of the, the negative, um, the sort of suite of negative health impacts that have been associated with these chemicals. Like and where, sorry? Where are those chemicals coming from? Where's that chemical coming from? Well, it turns out we use them everywhere. So then the drinking water that, uh, so the movie itself, Dark Waters, is about um, an, an, uh, an industrial manufacturing location in Parkersville, West Virginia. Um, but, you know, they're, they're the, it's basically an example of chemicals and modern commerce. Uh, my colleague Joe Allen in the School of Public Health named them forever chemicals because they're fluorine carbon bonds that basically don't ever want to break down. So they're, they're, they're st sticking around in the environment for a really long time. Um, they repel both oil and water. So we use them in fast food packaging, dental floss, pizza boxes. Um, we use them for firefighting. We use them as Scot you know, in Scotchgard. To, to coat furniture, they're a main component of carpets. They're literally everywhere right now. Um, They've been around since the late fifties. Yeah, late fifties. They weren't oh. before that. Were uh, no, no, they weren't. They were. These are manufactured. Um, so fluorine is one of the most abundant elements on Earth, but organofluorine, which is what these compounds are, are incredibly rare. There are just a few. Uh, plants that produce organofluorine. These are uh, chemistry nerd factoids. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? You can tell your friends about the, yeah. No, so, yeah. So, so there are just a few plants that produce organofluorine and the organofluorine is basically meant as a toxin to, you know, to protect the plant. And yet we've produced this and put it all around us and in all of our products. So, so, so it's, it's, it's not so smart in my opinion. And no, we really, not at all. yeah, and it, it sort of highlights an issue with, with different environmental chemicals, which is we really should be more thoughtful before we use something everywhere. Um, yeah. And we really need to, I think there's a, I mean, it's almost a, a societal or pedagogical issue because, um, you know, we're educating people in material science and, and chemists who build these things that we use every day. Right. But they're, they don't take a class in environmental health and they don't take a class in toxicology and they don't, they don't, so they don't, they're not taught to worry about such things. 
or, or big industries, they have a safety officer that works at the very end of the line of all the production of a plant. Right. So right. it's not it, a holistic approach. In, in yeah, that. yeah. So we need to, I think, be like you guys and ask the questions, well, it, it's, you know, it's, before it's, any of this happens. Yeah, I mean, you know, just sitting here thinking about it. So we have a farm up here in Michigan. And I, I'm just thinking about like when we went before we started planting, we went to look at other farms and places to purchase. And we we're tr trying to find where we we're going to, you know, set this farm up. At. We did so many soil samples of trying to figure out what was, you know, what chemicals were in the soils because it's a big cherry. There's a lot of cherries around the area that we're at. And so a lot of cherry farmers and a lot of cherry farmers used a lot of nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. and they'll do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, at, on our farm, we don't use any herbicides. We don't use any pesticides. And it's crazy to think that we went to such lengths to figure out how we could find a great, a great farm. But then I think of like what you were just saying earlier about like drinking water. I mean, it's just, it seems dumb that I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even be going down that road for just my basic drinking water for myself and my family. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. it's like these conversations to have these conversations to get this awareness out there is, you know, mm -hmm. it's just so needed. Like, yeah. It didn't make sense in my do head. Have, I didn't even think about that. Do you have a private well on your farm or? We do, we do yeah. Yeah. And did you do that? Because you would go through the same thing. Did you go through the well water testing? We did get, yeah, we did yeah, get it we tested. Did. It yeah. actually came out fairly well. Yeah. Fairly it, well, well water. Yeah, it was, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was decent. But, you know, our neighbors still use a lot of, you know, heavy chemicals. Yeah. And, and so it's just, get, you know, it gets frustrating, especially, you know, trying to, and it's not something that you can be overly, you know, nobody, uh, especially in this time, you know, overly assertive, but just trying to educate people and talk to people how maybe they could do something a little bit different in their farming practices that mm -hmm. would help the land entirely, but also not affect our, our well water. Mm -hmm. And are they receptive to that kind of, like, are they? Um, not really. You're seeing, I think what we're seeing is a lot of that next generation that is more receptive. Yeah. But when you're when you're still dealing with a lot of the older generation, it's been a tricky. It's been a really tricky conversation to have mm -hmm. uh, because no, you know, again, these practices they don't want to change because they've been doing them for you know generations, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get them to change. Mm -hmm. But I do see the uh, we we have seen a younger or I don't know. I don't know what it is, what the answer is, but I, we have seen a younger group of people that are taking some practices, you know, sort of like what we feel we are, whether it's biodynamic farming or whether it's, you know, regenerative, regenerative yeah. or organic farming. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, that, and that's, and that's, that's a plus. That's a positive. But, you know, getting back to, I mean, water is universal. Like we all have need water to survive mm -hmm. and be healthy. And, you know, I think, when if we go back to the basics of like food air water mm -hmm. the, of what we need i mean i think water again like you were saying how there is there's been decent regulations with air quality but not water quality so you know as individuals in in your community you know how do we how do we take care of ourselves our family and then how do we also continue to remain proactive in getting policies changed and speaking up and making sure that, you know, the attention's going to the health of the people, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, we all just need to basically get Brita, <laughs> you know, some kind of water filter. To water filters are good. Yeah. yeah. Any Grand time. challenges for water filters. I mean, I think that the issue is that there are communities that you know, they don't have this information. They're not as concerned about these issues. And those tend to be the ones that are most vulnerable as well. Right. And so when we talk about, it, it becomes an equity issue as well. So when we talk about access to clean food and clean drinking water, you know, there's, there's a hu huge disparity issue when we get into this. And I think, you know, the people with the least information are often the most impacted. And so one of the ways, at least that we 
we try to think about it is how do we, and I'm of course a scientist, so not effective at all at communication, but <laughs> you know, what we need to do is, is reach, reach these communities and work with them and, you know, make sure that, that those same measurements that you guys took at your farm and in your, your well, that, that, that those data are available in those locations. Um, right, right. You know, and there's a whole suite of NGOs who are working to help this happen. There are many scientists who are interested in this. There are, in fact, uh, programs funded by the NIH that focus on these community issues as well. And so I think with all of those things, we can do it, but we need to keep this dialogue going um, because I think it's so important that, that people know you know about some of the concerns you know with your with your neighbors who are maybe resistant to changing their historical practices i think having a conversation about health can be very informative so it's not we're doing this because it's the right thing to do it's we're doing this because we want to protect our families and we want to protect our neighbors and we want to protect the wildlife that lives around us um, so really understanding the health impacts of of the different chemicals that we're using um, can help in that dialogue. Oh, um, can I, I'm totally going to go back to the oceans, but um, you know, what about the microplastics? Mm -hmm. um, I, I had heard, you know, when you have like polyester, some kind of synthetic material that if you wash it up to like 10,000 little itty bitty microplastics can come out in one load of laundry that eventually goes to the ocean because it can't get cleaned out at the sewage treatment plant, so it ends up in the ocean. So what do you think about that <laughs> impacting all the fabrics when you're, you know? Yeah, so it turns out, I mean, this has actually been a really, so it actually segues perfectly from what we're talking about, and maybe you guys can help me with this. So, so I work on a variety of chemicals that you can't see. Right. And when you talk about a problem, we as humans are just conditioned to look for things. You know, we have our senses. We want to see things and smell things. And that's how we decide if something is safe. And when you're talking about things like heavy metals or organic pollutants, it seems like this. And it's a little bit like climate change, I would say. So when people feel a little bit ambivalent or not so concerned about climate change, I think sometimes it's because the impact, you know, it's, it, it, it sounds a bit abstract. So then we talk about plastic, right? Everybody knows what plastic is. Everybody's seen plastic degrade. We can see it on our beaches. Um, hopefully we don't have polyester pants, but that's another story. No, I'm kidding. Um, but, you know, so, so this is something I think that's very tangible that everybody can relate to. Um, in terms of the actual impact, so there is a lot of plastic mm -hmm. that's being released and accumulating in these ecosystems, and we've all seen pictures of wildlife, you know, being strangled by plastic and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of a direct impact on the health of those organisms, other than, you know, some sort of physical impact, it's, you know, and, and it, there is a consensus among many scientists that this is somewhat less severe than say um, some of these chemical contaminants or emerging contaminants that are being produced in really large quantities and being dumped into the ocean mm -hmm. um, but but the amount of support for for work on plastics has just been enormous and i think that's great for focusing attention on sort of threats to ocean ecosystems and and work um, and, and of course, the sheer volume of plastic is a concern. Um, but the main health concern associated with microplastics is if they act, so if they can actually um, carry the other chemicals with them. Oh, oh I wow. see. That's like, like, and, then, and so then when the organism eats the, the microplastic, it'll actually have the other chemical attached. And the negative health outcome would be the other chemical or the other pollutant. Right itself because the plastic itself is quite inert okay um so i'm not saying it's not a problem i just it's it's fascinating to me that this has been um such an effectively discussed problem sure. and i guess i'm i'm trying to understand how do we how do we learn from 
from that to promote some of these or, or attach some of these other issues in ocean conservation that are also a concern right now. Do you guys have ideas on that or suggestions as ocean advocates? It's funny when you say that because like, you know, if you've ever had a, a plastic container that you put food in and if there's any fat in it, like a pasta sauce, you know, it just stays like a ring around the plastic container because it's like the oil is soaked into the plastic and doesn't really move. And it sort of seemed like that for, you know, when you say like the little bits of plastic in the ocean and the chemicals are just yeah. Yeah. not moving. And, and when you're talking about the other um, chemicals that are affecting us in our environment, you know, with all the different, through the carpet, through our clothes, through Teflon, through all the different aspects, those chemicals are, are attracting into our fat and there's not going anywhere. It's like you can't really get them out of our body, right? Well, it depends on the chemical. Okay. <laughs> um, so some of them, it's not quite that bad. Okay. Some of them do accumulate. So there are, you know, there's stuff like uh, early life exposure to lead becomes integrated and, and you accumulate lead in your bones over your lifetime so that you're not really eliminating but a lot of these chemicals they pass through your body with different with different time periods so the half-life of mercury or methyl mercury in your body for example is like two months mm -hmm. so that's not great but that's also you know you can eat a lot of fish and then decide you know, you're going to make a life change and stop eating fish for a few months and then you're, you're be relatively in a oh, place. Um, some of these uh, persistent organic pollutants that I mentioned are, you know, do accumulate in your fat. They're still being eliminated continuously. Like your body's a remarkable thing and will try to get rid of all these chemicals. Um, some of them last for years. Um, but eventually, you know, it, it, and it, this is important because I think uh, we, we have to keep the mindset that we're not, you know, when, once something has happened, it's not just this irreversible change. Right. We can still fix the problem. Right. So yes, it may last for several years, but we can still make it better. And th there are a bunch of different behavioral choices that we can take as consumers that protects our health. Um, and, you know, there are a bunch of different choices that we as a society can make that would protect our entire planet. What would, you, what would be your top three that you would recommend yes. to an individual? So if somebody's watching this today, <laughs> what would you, what would you top three? Maybe for, like, for what purpose? Yeah. <laughs> for health or for planetary protection or for your personal health? Um, well, I mean, actually, if you look at, so I always like to, I have many colleagues, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I have many colleagues who are, and if you look at those data, and you talk to the nutritionists, you find, so you look at risks associated with contaminants, you find that with a very healthy diet and exercise and good sleep, you can actually overcome many of these risks. So that would be my first recommendation. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's this, this idea of, you know, consumer choices, and we were talking about climate change and contaminants. And I don't, you know, I don't, I believe everybody's, you know, food is a very cultural thing. So it's really important to respect that, that food has a lot of cultural and social significance. But if we can all be a little bit like Thomas Jefferson and be a flexitarian, yeah. instead of just eating large quantities of meat, particularly red meat, that can be incredibly beneficial for your health. Um, a lot of animal protein because of that biomagnification source does contain more, um, more of these toxins. So I think that's a good choice you can make for yourself. Um, and then I think, you know, in the, it, you, you just have to be almost aware with consumer products because that, you know, you, if you read labels on foods, if you look at packaging, um, you can often see the chemicals that are present um, in those products. So, um, 
yeah, but I got, I, I, that, that's a difficult one because I think for the average person, you know, even fish consumption advice, as you were saying, is difficult to track. So, so reading these product labels can be very difficult. I think uh, Michael Pollan summarized it well for food, which it would, do you guys remember? Do you know Michael Pollan, the author? Yeah, yeah. And then he said, uh, if, if you can't recognize it from your grandmother's kitchen, then you know, make me think twice about eating it. Um, you know, with 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 products and uh, clothing and things like this, like the more something needs to be kind of manufactured and the more chemically intensive a process, the more likely that you're exposing yourself to something that isn't great. Um, so with those with those consumer products, there's also a lot of websites set up. Um, like the EWG's website to, to tell you about, you know, how safe are these things that I want to use. Um, yeah. And I then it's really a personal preference. Yeah, the EWG has done, like there, you know, when you go on the Skin Deep database and type mm -hmm. different products that you mm -hmm. are using. Yeah. And you can grade it and, uh, and you can look up so many ingredients on that website. Yeah, and that will alleviate the burden of interpreting all the different chemicals yourself, which is what I was grappling with there a minute ago. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think there's a bunch of things that are just kind of common sense. Um, but I do, I guess, so I didn't, I did, that was far too long winded and I didn't give a ranked list at all. Um, but I do, I don't want to lose this element of like, you know, you, you take care of yourself and your family. Um, and be proactive about that. But then I think it's it's also upon us to really be engaged citizens. Yeah. And think about some of these issues that we've talked about today. So, you know, and, and talking about them and spreading the word because that's really how we make policy changes to reduce the sources of these pollutants that we're concerned about. Or even talk to industry, like you as a consumer, if you're using a skin cream, and you say, hey, I don't want this chemical in my skin cream. And a lot of people say the same thing, they'll take it out. Yeah. Um, we've seen this with these PFAS chemicals that I've mentioned. So there's a woman in uh, Berkeley, Arlene Bloom. Have you guys heard of her? She's uh, one of the original female uh, mountaineers. Okay. Uh, she's written a bunch of awesome books on women and climbing. She's really amazing. Um, oh. But she also happens to have a, a PhD in uh, toxicology or chemical science or something like this but she she founded this green science policy institute that you can look up and one of their missions is actually um, doing hiking trips <laughs> essentially where they bring together scientists um, and businesses and industry um, and they you know and, and different policy people and they just chat about these chemical issues and she's been so effective at you know getting some of these classes of chemicals that we're concerned about just replaced with things that we're less concerned about in our products so i think again those kinds of conversations can be really powerful yeah i think like just you know <clears throat> i think for me the one thing that you i would take away is just you know learning about the coal-fired plants and knowing that those uh the ability to roll back the amount of mercury that is being um, that is being put out is there, but we have the ability, the tech to do it, but it's just not being used right now. Yeah. Um, and, that makes me want to just go have more conversations with other people about that because it seems like that's that's a, dr a direct avenue to go down to start reducing the amount of mercury. That's obviously um, yeah. And if I could arm you with their counter arguments around the mercury regulation. So, the, so we talked a little bit about this. Um, the, the stance that the, the current administration has put forward is that the benefits of reducing those emissions um, are very small. So to the tune of a few million dollars whereas the costs which have already been inve invested but forget that for now um, were billions of dollars for those plants. And that was the main argument for that coal-fired regulation, power plant regulation. So on the surface, it sounds a little weird, right? So you hear, 
costs of a regulation and the billions of dollars and benefits millions. Well, hmm, that's yeah. odd. And yeah. so you look a little bit under the hood at how they came up with those numbers. Um, they only looked at the health impacts on the children of recreational fishers. <laughs> Yeah. Freshwater recreational fishers, not even marine. Freshwater? So oh. the children of freshwater recreational anglers in this country. So that's the benefits assessment because it was difficult to do it for everyone else. Whereas we know everybody is exposed to mercury. We could measure it in every single person. So it's, it's, it's one of those kind of bait and switch arguments, which, you know, you'll get technical dialogue from you know some group and they'll throw a bunch of numbers at you um, and for you guys who are out there advocating for these issues you should always ask what those numbers mean um, in this case a judge said oh well that seems in legal language arbitrary and capricious because why would we make a regulation and invest billions of, of dollars on behalf of society when we're only going to get a few million dollars in benefits, but the, the underlying analysis is completely flawed. And in fact, EPA's own science advisory board wrote a scathing note saying, this analysis needs to be redone. It's completely flawed. You, you shouldn't overturn this regulation the day before they overturned the regulation. <laughs> so, so just- from the administration that just, comes in and just vetoes it, basically? Yeah. Yeah, they just move forward with it. So it's in the courts. It's ongoing. Um, we can hope that, you know, it'll get thrown out again. But, you know, I think there's a, a lesson to be learned in that, which is, you know, you often get the sort of technical you know, numbers and figures and analyses, and you kind of want to take a step back and, and think about from a common sense perspective, does this sound right to me? And if not, and this has come up a few times in different types of work that I've done, um, where, you know, consultants or regulators will throw a bunch of information at a community and it, you know, it's a big body of information and then they're not the technical experts, but it sounds wrong. So I would say when it sounds wrong, trust <laughs> that it probably is wrong <laughs> and ask for more information, right? Yeah. So. Um, so you gave us three great tips about your personal health as a community, as a, an advocate for this planet and for the health of the planet. What would be three things that you would recommend us doing what would be three things that I would recommend? Today, like, would we be writing the EPA and saying, like, you know, start, start filtering out all the mercury at the coal plants, shut the coal plants down, water quality? I mean, what are the, like, top things that you think we should start to focus on? Well, I think, actually, that's not a question for me. What I always say to people is, what you should think about is what are your top three things that you care most about? Because this is really about all of us, right? So I have my list of things that I care most about, and you've heard a lot about that today. Um, but I think we all do, right? We all have these issues that we're passionate about. And if every single one of us said, okay, I'm passionate about these three things, so I'm gonna do something on these three things today, we would make huge progress. You know, and, and one of us might care about, you know, flame retardants in children's pajamas and another person might care about coal-fired power plants and mercury and another person might care about safe and sustainable seafood. And that's great. Like, we should all do whatever resonates with us, right? But it, it's, it's like we have to be active and we have to be engaged and we can't, we can't let this current climate overwhelm us and say... You know, no, I'm just going to sit back and watch Netflix and <laughs> give up. <laughs> don't, eat micro don't eat microwave popcorn on your couch. It's very high in PFAS. <laughs> it's one of the worst. Um, yes, really. Microwave. But if we did, no. <laughs> your popcorn. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> so yeah, that's what, that's what I say. Cause I think, you know, if it's, if it's an issue that's personal to you, like your farm or your family or where you grew up, like that, that's how we care about things. And that's what motivates us, you know? And I always, when I teach classes on this stuff, the first exercise we do is I ask every student to think about their hometown and, and, and read about it and come back to me with something that they care about that happened there because that's, that's how we care about things, right? Yeah. So. And that's what keeps that self-motivation. Yeah. And you will, um, you know, put on the gas pedal, so to speak, of mm -hmm. you know, trying to make some change or you know, help your yeah, and we all can't do everything, right? Like there, there are so many things that we could all be thinking about and caring about. Um, it's just that we all we have to kind of divide the the various issues and all work on it. Um, so we need to do that together, I think. Yeah, and locally, I mean, with a, that saying, "Think globally, act locally." Mm -hmm. you know, I think it, it really does go back to really helping on a local level if we mm -hmm. all. Can help on a local level, then we're going to be impacting in a greater way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And those local community changes can provide a template for action that can occur globally. So it is really amazing, like the, the transition between action that takes place on a community level and how that then sort of can be transformed to inform larger scale policy dialogues and things like that. I think people forget that, you know, when you, you think about, say, a global regulation, that global regulation is based on local case studies or local understanding of health impacts or something like that when you're talking about an environmental toxicant or any of these chemicals. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it is very much at the individual level, as you're describing. Well, uh, yeah. have I exhausted you? <laughs> uh, so much, uh, Dr. Yeah. thank you oh, so much for. Yeah, it was really fun talking to you guys.